what we would be trying to do would be uh, we would be trying to go through certain basics of echocardiography and uh, it's a huge topic believe me um, i'll try to cover whatever is essential and a little bit of te and uh, probably a slide on uh, certain other modes as well so because we have to do it in uh, around 40 45 minutes i'll start and uh, let's see how quickly can we do it so this is basically the historical aspect wherein uh, it was actually initially uh, you know thought about by a guy called christian doppler who noted that the pitch of a sound wave varied if the source of the sound was moving um, then uh, piezoelectricity was which was discovered by curie in 1880 took it forward and they were able to create ultrasonic waves then there was a guy called helmut hertz who obtained a commercial ultrasonoscope he collaborated with dr edler who was a practicing cardiologist in sweden and they actually used this commercial ultrasonoscope to examine the heart. And this collaboration was the beginning of clinical echocardiography, as we are aware of today. So how do we actually see images? It is basically a type of ultrasound test, which is using high-pitched sound waves to produce an image of the heart. Now, the sound waves are sent through a device, which is called as a transducer, and they get reflected from the various structures of the heart. These echoes, which are reflected, are converted into pictures of the heart that can be actually seen and they are reproducible on a video monitor. So that's how we actually see these images. Now, type of ultrasound test that can use high-pitched sound waves to produce, basically, uh, to produce an image of the heart. Sound waves are... Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the same thing. Yeah, sorry. So how to do it and get images as well? What you see is the image of a transducer which actually emits these waves. Then we wait for some time till the point in time there's a reflection of these waves depending on their transmission and then they are returned. So basically you apply gel to a transducer to allow transmission. This gel is applied to the transducer to, uh, so that uh, the transmission can happen from the skin of the sound, to the, from the skin to the sound waves from the transducer to the skin. And this transducer will actually transform the echo, that is the mechanical energy, into an electrical signal, which will be processed and displaced as an image on the screen. Now, this is called as a grayscale image. Now, grayscale image is actually generated based on the intensity of the reflected echo. If there are calcifications uh, or if it is pericardium, it would be reflected as uh, uh, white. If it is fluid or blood, it would be reflected as black. And uh, if it is myocardium, that would be seen actually in gray color. So that is how the reflected image looks like. Now, what are the components of the echo machine? You've got a pulse generator, which applies high amplitude voltage to energize the crystals. You've got a transducer, which converts electrical energy to mechanical energy and vice versa. You've got a receiver, which actually detects and amplifies the weak signals. Then you've got a display, wherein you can actually see these ultrasound signals in a variety of modes. And then you have a memory which actually stores these displays in the form of a video. So this is a transducer, which is responsible for both transmitting and receiving the signal. Then you have a transducer which consists of an electrode and a piezoelectric system whose ionic structure will result in deformation of shape when exposed to an electric current. Then you've got a transducer consisting of an electrode and a piezoelectric system. And Resulting in deformation of shape when exposed to an electric current, alternately, ex which expands further to create some more sound waves. So, this is good for that. So then we come to types of echo. What are the types of echo that we are looking at? The usual standard echo is transphoresic, in which you have certain views called as left parasternal, apical views, suprasternal views. Then you have a transesophageal echo, you have an epicardial intracardiac echo, which of course I'm not going to cover in too much detail. Our main focus of the talk today would be on transthoracic echo. So basic physics would be a transesophageal echo and intracardiac echo. They use higher frequency sound waves, which generate actually a higher resolution images. The type of frequency that is used is Whereas a transthoracic echo will use a lower frequency sound wave which generates a low resolution image, that is to the tune of 3 megahertz. So this is a rough thing of how to do it actually in relatively stable patients. The patient would lie on the bed, preferably left side, 
sonographer will move the transducer on the patient's chest. You have the heart and then you have the Now, these are common through windows that you see here. These are the places where you keep the probe or the transducer and you are actually able to generate those images. The common sites include a suprasternal window, an apical window, a subcostal window and a parasternal window. So, these are the four sites where you actually put your images which will help you interpreting the pathologies. So, these are also called as acoustic windows. The same thing in repetition that is one is parasternal, second is a apical window, third is a subcostal window and fourth is a suprasternal notch. So, we start off with which rests on the left sternal edge. Most of the times, the image is acquired from a place between second to fourth in the space. The marker dot direction, as you can see, the blue points towards the right shoulder. Most of the eco studies will begin this, this view and it will set the stage for subsequent eco views. If you look at the image on the right, you can actually find it out. I mean, how does it look? You know, you have got a mitral valve, you've got an inferior valve, you've got a mitral valve, then which opens up into the left ventricular and the left ventricular outflow tract going into the aortic valve. Higher than that is the septum and the right ventricular outflow tract. This is how a typical PLAX or a parasternal long axis view looks like. So, what we are actually looking at in PLAX is right ventricle size and function, left ventricle size and function, aorta, ascending aorta, size of ascending aorta, then you are looking at the aortic valve, then you are looking at mitral valve, looking at calcification in that. You are also looking at pericardium and you are trying to look at whether your, your patient has some fluid or a pericardial diffusion on it. So this is how it looks like. You've got a cross section of the heart and uh, this is the same image in much more detail. You can have a look at it. The image is very self-explanatory that you start off from an inferior wall to mitral left which opens up into left ventricular and left ventricular outflow tract going on to aortic valve and uh, on top you have the right ventricular outflow tract and the septum. So what we attempt to see, if you label it clearly, First is the pericardial space, second is RV, third is the septum, fourth is the left ventricular, left ventricle, fifth is the anterior, anterior mitral valve defect, sixth is the aortic view, and seven is the left end. Then we come to the next view, which is a parasternal short axis view. Again, you are still in the left sternal leg, second to fourth intercostal space. Now you have to change the mark. There's a 90 degree clockwise movement from the PLAX. Now the marker points the left the left hip and is operated different from the order to the LV apex. We'll go, uh, we'll start looking for it. When we talk in terms of apex to base, what you can see is different levels. It's a schematic diagram. What you look at apical level, what you look at papillary muscle, what you look at terminal, and what you look at the then you have got a mitral valve uh, level where you see a mitral valve ventricular level uh, where uh, again you see one of the applications. So, how to understand it? So, you rotate it clockwise 90 degrees, and what you see is this. This is the long axis of the left ventricle. And uh, here you see the anterior wall, the septum, the right ventricle, and the left ventricle. 